morning again. Um, glad you guys are here, and what a great time of worship, wasn't it? Amen. Yeah, I appreciate them leading us to the throne this morning. Um, and uh, we are on our second part of a series called How to Be a Wise Guy. And um, Abraham Lincoln said this. He said, I am profoundly engaged in reading the Bible. This is the 16th president of the United States. I am profoundly engaged in reading the Bible. Take all of this book upon reason that you can and the balance of faith, and, it will li- and you will live and die a better man. I like that. Don't you? In other words, what are you saying? I mean, right there, you talk about words of wisdom. Those are words of wisdom from Abraham Lincoln. This entire book right here, You take that with as much reason as you can, and you couple that, though, with faith, and guys, it is going to change your life. It will change your life. And so that's that's why we're doing this series on wisdom. I want you guys to live better lives. I want to live a better life, don't you? I mean, don't we all want to? So uh, last week we began with an introduction on wisdom. We talked about sister wisdom and talked about the need for wisdom in our lives. Um, And today what we're going to do is we're going to hang out primarily in the book of Proverbs. So if you want to turn there in your Bible, go ahead and do that because we're going to be all over the place there. A few other passages we'll throw in. But last week we we introduced wisdom to you. This week we're going to talk about the importance of discipline, all right, in our lives. Um, And uh, here's what I want to say this. But a lot of times when you think when you hear the word discipline, you think different things. A lot of times some people hear the word discipline and they think punishment, right? Um, and that's part of it. We're going to talk about that. Other times we hear the word discipline and it's, we think, well, I've got to be disciplined in, in doing something. It's something repetitive that I have to do over and over. If I'm going to run or if I'm going to work out, I've got to be disciplined in my workouts and things like that, right? Well, for our purposes today, I want you to write this down. That first little blank I have for you, discipline is synonymous with the word correction. I want you to write that down. Discipline equals correction, all right? Um, and, and here's why. As we begin our journey this morning looking at discipline, we got to understand that discipline and correction can often be the same thing, and we need both of them, Right? We need both of them. And so here's what I want to do this morning. I'm going to do three things, and we're going to do them quickly. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, here's what happens if you ignore discipline in your life, all right? Here's what happens if you ignore correction. If you lack it, there are some consequences. If you have it, then the second thing we're going to do, if you have discipline in your life, then you're going to benefit from that. There's positive consequences. And then finally, I want to end our time together this morning uh, saying, helping you stay focused on, on discipline. I want to give you some action steps, if you will, on how to, okay, how can I live a disciplined life? How can I learn from my mistakes? What are some things I need to look for? By the way, we all make mistakes, right? Anybody here not ever made one? I think there was that one time, like in 1989, I made a mistake. And since then, perfection. Just ask my wife and kids, they'll tell you, right? Um, Yeah, we all, so we got to learn from those mistakes. We got to learn from that. So here's what I want to do. Let's start with the first part. Here's what happens without discipline and correction in your life, or without you at least learning from it, all right? Without discipline and correction in your life, I'm going to give you four quick things that happen here, and they're not good. You, you don't want to live here, all right? This is, this is where you don't want to be. First one is this. Without dis- discipline and correction in your life, we're going to go back kind of where we started last week. You are without understanding. You're without understanding, all right? Proverbs 15.32 says this, if you reject discipline, look what happens. You only harm yourself. 
If you reject discipline, you only harm yourself. But if you listen to correction, you grow in understanding. Does that make sense? All right. If you reject discipline, it actually, it, it could harm some other people, but primarily the person who's going to suffer the most is you. All right. But if you listen to correction, you're going to gain some understanding. Now, let me just state the obvious. This should be obvious, but I'm going to state the obvious because sometimes we're pretty good at missing the obvious. All right. If you make a mistake, if you screw up, or if you simply are in sin, and you ignore the consequences of those choices, and then you go and do the same thing again, then I think it's safe to say you are a man or a woman who lacks understanding. Wouldn't you agree? If you continue to do the same thing over and over, you're not, and there's consequences. You are, I think that's also the definition of insanity. <laughs> you do the same thing over and over, and you, you expect a different result, you know. But you're, you're lacking some understanding there. And that's, what the, that's kind of where we are with this this morning. I want you to understand that if you don't accept correction and discipline in your life, you're, not gonna under, you're, you're just going to continue to live. Matter of fact, let me put it this way. I, I tell you what, here's another way to put it. Number two, if you lack discipline or don't accept discipline and correction in your life, let me just put it this way, you're just plain stupid. All right? Now, hold on a second. That's right, I said it. I said it. Uh, I know, hold on now, all right? Um, because if you, it, if it, it does not make sense, guys, for us to make the same mistake over and over and over. If we c- accept correction and discipline and uh, don't accept it, then we're just plain dumb. Do they still do that at Cracker Barrel, at those little triangle things where you do the pegs? You know, and, and, and if you leave like four or five more, doesn't it, it, it says you're just plain dumb. Remember, it says that. You know, I, I never wanted to be just plain dumb. I just, so I would cheat if I had to and not leave, one, you know, four or five pegs. Yeah, but listen, I'm in good, listen, don't get mad at me for calling us stupid. It, it comes right out of scripture. Look what it says in Proverbs 12, 1. To learn, you got to love discipline. If you want to learn anything, you've got to learn to love discipline. But he also says it's stupid to hate correction. It's just, it's a stupid thing to not want to learn, to not learn from your mistakes, to not discipline it. So don't get mad at me for calling a lack of discipline in your life stupid, all right? Go, get mad at the Bible, all right? Because I got it straight from there. Here's another verse I think that helps us understand uh, the ignorance of not embracing discipline. Look at what it says, Proverbs 15, 5. You children especially, listen to this, wherever my kids are, all right? Listen, only a fool despises a parent's discipline. Whoever learns from correction is wise, but only a fool is going to despise discipline. Are we getting this? Are you guys picking up on this? All right. To ignore discipline and correction in your life leaves you with a lack of understanding, and quite frankly, it just makes you stupid. It's, you're not, it's not wise, all right? Um, so, all right, in case some of you are stupid and not getting this, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't believe that at all. You're, none of you guys are stupid. Let me give you a third one then, all right? In case we're not getting it, though, we need a little more. To lack discipline, to lack understanding is this. Here's what's going to happen. Without it, you and I are headed for a fall, just quite frankly. We're headed for a fall, all right? Look at what he says in in Proverbs. It says in Proverbs 10, 17, people who accept discipline are on the pathway to life. Isn't that awesome? You accept correction, you accept discipline, you accept the fact that, hey, I made a mistake, I'm going to learn from it, you're headed down the right path. Even when you make mistakes, we just saying it is well. It's well because God is sovereign, but it's also well because we accept the correction and discipline of God and we go the direction he wants us to. But those who ignore correction, Solomon says, he says, those who ignore correction, you are going to go astray. You are not going to stay on that straight path. Um, see, discipline instruction help you not to make the same mistakes twice, all right? Um, now, just go with me for a minute here. Just go with me. But if you stick, <laughs> if you stick a bead up your nose and it gets stuck there and it's an unpleasant experience, probably you're not going to do it again, right? True story. Christmas morning, years ago, I don't know, my, my firstborn child, who's now 19, he was like four at the time, I think, um, he's, you know, playing and doing whatever, and I don't remember what he got for Christmas, but whatever he, we got had these little beads with it. And he comes very calmly and taps on my shoulder and says, Dad? Says, yes, son. He goes, I have a bead up my nose. 
And I said, I, what? I'm sorry? He goes, nah, I, I got a beat. And sure enough, I, I could, you know, you could see it like lodged right in his nose. It's Christmas morning. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I don't know what to do. I don't want to put anything up in there and I don't know where it's going to go. So finally we get dressed, we get in the car, we, we, right down the road from us was a fire department. And lo and behold, the fire department has this machine, a little tube. They just stuck the tube right up his nose, turned the suction on and sucked the bead right out. All is well. But the best part of that whole story is this. My, my, the, the brilliant wisdom of my four-year-old son is we're driving or driving back home. And just, uh, you know, I, my wife and I are just talking. He's in the back seat. And he goes, Mom, Dad? Yes, son. He goes, I want you to know that I learned a very valuable lesson today. <laughs> and I'm not going to stick any more beads up my nose. <laughs> Um, well, the point I'm trying to make here, because I'm sure you're really wondering, where is he going with this, all right, is that we're going to screw up. We're going to make mistakes. We're, we're going to stick the proverbial bead up our nose, I guess. But if we don't learn from those mistakes, if we don't have the wisdom of my four-year-old son sitting in the back seat saying, hey, I learned a valuable lesson today, guess what? You're going to lodge some things in places you don't want them lodged. <laughs> And eventually, they're going to go places you don't want them to go, and bad things are going to result. Does that make sense? All right? So I think you get the idea. Let me give you one more before we move on. If you lack or ignore discipline or correction in your life, here's what's going to happen. You're going to be, you're going to be dishonored. You're going to be dishonored. Look at what, what he says here in Proverbs 13, 17. If you ignore criticism, here's what's going to happen. You're going to end up in poverty and in disgrace. Now, if you accept correction, you're going to be honored. But obviously, the opposite of that is if you don't accept it, if you don't accept correction, you will be dishonored. Now, I, I want to just say something real quick. I think I may have caused a little confusion last week when I made a comment about Donald Trump that I want to clear up, all right, just, just to make it clear here. Um, what I said last week, and it led, I think, just one or two, it led him to believe that I was, I was voting for Hillary Clinton um, and, and just, you know, I, I want to uh, clear that up. I, I, I I'll tell you who I voted for until after church. I'll tell you that. Um, but, it, but it wasn't Hillary Clinton. Anyway, um, but it, I, I, here's what I want to say. What I meant to say was this about Donald Trump, and somehow it got twisted. All I was saying is this. There was a point really where I was uncertain about Donald Trump. And here's what I mean. I, I could sit back and I could see that this man was obviously a successful businessman. He made billions. He's obviously done well in doing something. No matter what his moral character, no matter what, you know, I, I was still assessing the situation. And, and man, I'll just be honest, it was fun watching The Apprentice and watching him say, you're fired. And that Donald Trump, I can't impress any Donald Trump. I wish I could. But, you know, how he says that, that was cool stuff. But, but when that video came out, that audio tape of the things that he was saying about women and what he wanted to do to women and how he treated women, all I was saying is any respect that I may have had for him was kind of out the window now. Does that make sense? In other words, it doesn't matter how successful he is. And I'm not just picking on Donald Trump. He is our president-elect. He is going to be our president. And I will honor that position and I will pray for our president no matter what I think of him. And had it been Hillary, no matter what I think of her. All right? That's, that's not the point I'm trying to make. We're, this isn't a political thing. The point is, though, I don't care whether you're Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, Tim Burnett, or you sitting here. If we ignore discipline and correction in our lives, everything that you have worked for, even whether that's an empire or a small thing, but it's yours, you will lose dishonor. You look like a fool when you don't accept the consequences. Does that make sense? You look like a fool when you don't say, whoa, that was a mistake. I'm not going to stick that bead up my nose anymore, right? I'm not going to do that, all right? Does that make sense? We don't want it to go away. And, and the Scripture is very clear. When you don't accept discipline and correction in your life, you're dishonored. People begin to just say, you know what? I'm not trusting that guy or that gal anymore. It's not going to happen. All right, so um, I hope you're getting a good understanding here of what happens when you lack correction or discipline. Just to recap, here's what we said. If you ignore it... Um, you, you, you lack understanding, you're just plain dumb or stupid, all right? You're headed for a fall, and you lose honor. Make sense? All right, so let's go. That's kind of the negative. That's kind of like the not, the, the, the not fun stuff. Let's go to the next part then. So what happens then, guys, when we accept discipline or correction in our life? What happens when we have those things here? Uh, well, let's find out. Here's the first one. With, with discipline, with correction in your life, here's what happens. You will mature. You're going to grow. You are going to mature. 
I, to me, guys, this is truly one of the greatest benefits of receiving and accepting discipline and correction in your life. Because if you allow it, and I'm going to speak to that more in just a minute, but if you allow it, it will grow you. It will turn you into a better man or woman. It will, all right? Look at these verses. Proverbs 13, 11 says this. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline. Don't do it. And don't be upset when he corrects you, all right? It's, it's just don't, all right? And the reason that we shouldn't be upset, and let's pause for just a moment and state the obvious, nobody likes discipline or correction at first, right? Especially when it's God disciplining you. Or maybe it was a parent, whatever. It stings at first. It hurts. It's not, it's like, oh, yay, good, I'm about to get disciplined. I can't wait. No, typically as a kid, I'd run, right? Catch me if you can, Dad. And he always did. But anyway, I don't know why I ran. It was worse. But guess what? It helps us. Godly correction, godly discipline in our lives, guys, helps us to mature. It helps us to grow, all right? Now, I think if anybody understood this, the Apostle Paul understood this. All right, look at these words from him. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. That's 95% of what we're gonna do is in Proverbs today, but I got a couple other verses in here. here. This one's from the New Testament. Look at what Paul says about his life. When I was a child, I spoke and I thought and I reasoned as a child. All right, are you with me so far on that? When you are a child, you're gonna act like a child. But there comes a day church, well, we got to grow up. There comes a day, he says, and when I grew up, I then put away childish things. In other words, I, my lifestyle changed. No longer did I do the stupid, immature things that I used to do, but now I am maturing and I'm growing, and I've got to say no to some of those things that I used to do when I was younger. And I'm sure if the Apostle Paul were here today, he would tell you point blank that part of that process of maturation, part of that process of him growing and putting away the childish things was a, a direct result of the discipline and correction that Paul faced in his life. Paul would tell you every hardship that he endured, it helped him to be a better man of God. I don't have time today, but here's what, if you want some, if you want some, um, some good light reading this week, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. There is Paul's resume of the hardships that he's gone through in his life. Let me just give you a couple of them here. Again, I'm not gonna read it, but numerous times Paul was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He was out at sea for a whole night. He was imprisoned. He was snake bitten. He was without clothes. He had sleepless night. He was without food. It just goes on and on and on. And I'm pretty sure that times, just like we read about Job, probably just like Job, Paul cried out, why God? Why? Why all these struggles? Why all these heartaches? But yet, if you have read the Bible at all, two-thirds of our New Testament is written by this guy named Paul. He used to be Saul, but God corrected him, and he accepted that discipline, and now he has written most of the New Testament for us. Isn't that awesome? And it matured him, and it made him wiser. As he went through these things, he never faltered. He never gave up, just like Job. He lived his life in a way that actually the discipline and correction made him wiser. Church, I'm here to tell you this morning, it will do the same thing for you and me. But you've got to accept it. You've got to be willing to embrace that. And let's just be honest. Let's just be honest. And I don't know what it is for you, but some of us, it's time that we put some childish things away. It's time, it's time that we grow up. And we be the men and women of God that he's called us to be. And we accept discipline and instruction in our lives. Life is not easy. Life is hard. But as we sang this morning, it is still well. Because God is sovereign. He is in control. And his discipline and correction makes us wiser. So that's the first thing, um, is that, it, that we know that it matures us. It grows us. Here's the second thing about discipline. That at first, we, 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 this is not what we see. But man, you've got to know it's here. You know what discipline and instruction does if you accept it? It helps you know that you are loved. Look at, look at what Proverbs 3.12 says. For the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Notice that. The father delights in the child. The heavenly father delights in you, but because he's crazy about you, because he loves you, he's going to correct you. Any parent who doesn't correct is not a parent who loves their kid. It's just not. 
How many of you remember when your parents made that ridiculous statement? When you were about to be punished, now son, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you, right? And you're thinking, yeah, right, tell my butt that in just a second, right? I mean, sorry, but just seriously, you know, what, what, a, what a crock, what a load, as you're the one on the receiving end of that punishment, right? But now that I'm a 43-year-old man with uh, several children of my own, I get that. I get it. I get what it means, you know? Um, now that I've gotten older and I've matured in the faith and of my kids, I know what that means. How many of you look back and you're thankful for the discipline and the correction that your parents gave you? Now, listen, I, I want to pause for just a moment because I know that some of you, it's very possible, had some parents who their correction was not in love and it was abusive. And I understand that. And it's difficult in that to see love and there's probably not love there. That is never, that is never the intent of our Heavenly Father. And that should never be the intent of, a, of an earthly parent. Never. But for those who actually love us, when they discipline us, it is a good thing. For those of you who had parents that disciplined you, they loved you. Know that. For those of you who are parents and you don't discipline, it says, I don't care about you kids. I don't love you. All right? And so guys, we know when we receive discipline and correction from the Lord, it hurts. But it's essential to our maturity, and it shows us that God is madly in love with us. Amen? Isn't that an awesome thought? All right, and, and finally, here's the third thing. Um, if you accept discipline and rejection in your life, then just bottom line, guess what? Then you become wise. You become wise or wiser. Look at what Proverbs 1.5 says. Let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. Let the wise listen to these Proverbs, these instructions that are written down here from you that are in God's word. Listen to them and you will become wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance. All right? Ultimately, this is the whole goal of this sermon series, but more importantly, this is the whole goal of, of discipline. It's to make you wiser. It's to make you smarter. I, guys, I believe this. I, I am the man I am today because of the correction and the discipline in my life. I've become wiser. Now, I, like Solomon, if God came to me tonight and said, hey, I'll give you anything you want, what would it be? I, I, I can almost guarantee you I would say wisdom. I, I need more wisdom every day on how to be a better dad. I need more wisdom every day on how to be a better pastor. I need more wisdom every day on how to be a better, well, now, now I'm, well, I've already served on it one year, but I was reelected to the Hines County School Board. I need to know wisdom on how, how to, you know, lead effectively that way. I, I need wisdom on how to love my neighbor, the ones that are easy to love and the ones that are hard to love. Are you with me? All right, that's what happens. And, and, but I will stand before you today, not in, in arrogance at all, but in pure humility, because I've received some spiritual spankings, let me tell you. But I'm wiser now than I was 20 years ago, and I cannot wait to see what's going to happen in 20 more years. I mean that, because I need to grow, all right? And guys, you can be too. So how do we do that then? All right, because this is great talk and great thoughts here, but what can I do, Pastor Tim, in order to, to live this out, to flesh this out? All right, because we've learned now what it, what it means, what's going to happen if you don't have wisdom or discipline in your life, and we've learned what, some benefits to having it, so how do I do it? So here's what I want to do. On, on the last part of your outline there, I, I've given you a, an acrostic. We're going to use the word uh, focus, all right, F-O-C-U-S. We're going to use that word. I'm going to just give you some steps here that are going to help you stay focused, if you will, on how to have discipline and correction in your life or how to benefit from that discipline and correction. Does that make sense? So let me give you these five things here, all right? Here's the first one. The first action step is this. Follow the example of others. That's the first thing. Follow the example of others. Proverbs 2.20 says this. This is huge. Follow the steps of good men instead. Now, instead of what? Well, and stay on the path of the righteous. Well, follow the path of good men instead, I would think, instead of the path of evil men, right? Yeah. There are some of us who are hanging out with the wrong crowd. 
there are some of us who are listening to and viewing some of the wrong things. And the bottom line is that we have got to have people in our lives that we know are wiser than ourselves. Let me tell you what, I don't care how wise you are, there's somebody wiser than you, right? Better believe it. And we need those people in our lives. And I, I don't know about you, but I have been so fortunate to have some great men and women in my lives who I have, I have watched them accept correction and discipline as well as administer it. I've seen that. And, and let me just, some of those people, and I've seen them do this with great humility. Of course, my own parents um, who have been in the ministry. Dad's been in the ministry over 45 years, and he and mom are about to celebrate not long from their 50th wedding anniversary. And I've seen, uh, yeah, I, we're not here yet, so don't get excited, all right? You've you got to make sure they make it there. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, you know, but, uh, I, I, you know, obviously I've seen them do that. Um, I, there, are, there are two people in high school, let me tell you what, I absolutely hated this couple, yet loved them to death. Their names are Rodney and Teresa Harris at a church that Dad pastored in Kentucky. Because every single Wednesday night, see, the last part, uh, the, I grew up a peak kid, and I began to, to see some of the politics involved in church, and I began to see some of the negative side of it, and it ticked me off, and I didn't like it, and I was kind of coming bitter, and, and I wanted to hang out with the cool crowd over here. And so I just, me and God, I, I still liked him, but I just wasn't doing what God called me to do. I wasn't living for him. And Rodney and Teresa Harris, every Wednesday, they didn't care if I was the preacher's kid or not. They didn't care what. Rodney and Teresa would corner me, and they would ask me questions about my life. And they would chime, they would, they would, they would tell me, what you're doing is wrong, Tim, this and this and this. And I hated it, but yet every Wednesday night, I showed back up. And deep inside, I wanted to hear it. You know why? Because that showed that Rodney and Teresa Harris loved me. And along with my parents and my youth pastor and some other folks, they were key people in my lives who a few years later helped me make a decision to not only follow Jesus you know, within here, but to live for him in full-time ministry. Amen? Amen. Another guy that, that you've heard me mention his name that was huge in my life is Kurt Salerno. Kurt Salerno was a mentor to me and, and also. So if follow the example of godly people, not ungodly people. Follow the example of godly people. Notice how they have accepted correction and discipline in their lives. And when they give some to you, I'll just, I, this wasn't in my notes, but I'll just say this real quick. I, I meet with five guys uh, every Friday morning at 8.15 to 9.15 via telephone. One guy's in Indiana, two are in Louisiana, and, and, and me and Pastor Matt uh, Friedemann are right here in, in Mississippi. And I'll be honest with you, a couple of weeks ago, I was having a pity party on the phone. Um, I was, I was kind of complaining about just the lack of success within the church. Uh, we, you know, want us to see us grow more and some of my own personal issues. And I had said some things and, and Dr. Friedman just, he listened and afterwards he goes, now, can I, can I be honest with you for a few minutes? I said, sure. And basically he said, you need to suck it up, Tim. <laughs> and let me tell you a few things. And matter of fact, a couple of things you just said, and I won't go into that. He goes, I, I think they're, I, don't, I think they was almost sinful. Because you're, you're putting, you're, you're challenging God in an area that I don't think you have any right to challenge God. And i tell you what, at first, discipline and correction, it makes you mad. I want to just hang up the phone. I don't need these guys. But as the week went on and I processed that, I am so thankful for the guidance and correction that this, these wiser men bring to my life. Amen? Follow the example of others. Second thing is this. You know what? Not only follow others, but observe yourself. All right, and I'm not trying to get into some Eastern philosophical weird stuff. I'm, I'm talking straight out of Scripture. Look what it says in Proverbs chapter 2, verses 2 and 5. He says, turn your ears to wisdom. Concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. This, this word understanding comes up all the time in the Proverbs. I've, I've noticed that as I've done my study in Proverbs and on this, on this series on wisdom. Wisdom and, and understanding go hand in hand, all right? Search for them as you would silver. So I want you to see, tune your ears, concentrate, cry out, ask for understanding, search. You see all these things? You're observing this. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord and you will gain knowledge of God. Guys, self-observation is always a good thing. It is. If you're not paying attention to your own spiritual growth, how are you going to know how to monitor it, right? So I ask again, and I'll probably ask this one more time before we finish this message out. What are you reading? What are you watching? 
What are you listening to? What are you doing? What are you thinking? What is it? Are you paying attention? Are you crying out for wisdom? Are you crying out for insight? Or are you just excited about the next show on Netflix? Ooh, I just stepped on toes there, <laughs> including my own. I love me some Longmire, right? Self-observation is always good. Solomon says, listen, turn your ears to wisdom. Really focus here and concentrate on what it means to understand and always seek the ways of the Lord. That means, guys, you cannot do that if you are distracted by the things of the world, which leads us to the letter C. And the letter C in the word focus is this. Clear out distractions. Clear them out. Look at what Proverbs 4, 25 through 27 says. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Notice this. He says, look straight ahead. Are you with me? You get that, get that image in your head. Because to the right and to the left, there's all kinds of temptations. Remember, we talked about that last week. We used this side of the room as the illustration. Here's the immoral woman's house that he, ta- that, that, that he talked about. And then he, and he said, I looked out the window and I saw a man who lacked common sense. He was stupid. Because on this side of the road over here, man, this was, now it's a little harder path, it's a little more narrow, and, 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 but it's clear of those sinful distractions. It's not as comfortable to take this path, but this is where you should go. But yet, I looked out the window, Solomon says, and I see a, a, just a, a, a stupid man who was walking right by those temptations. And again, I think that's the picture you're getting here. Don't fix your eyes, because over to the left and right, man, there's all kinds of distractions, so many things that can sidetrack you. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. I love it right now as I'm giving that illustration. As I look back, there is Jesus Christ on the cross in a painting that we have. I see that. Keep your eyes focused in that direction, right? What lies before you is mark out a straight path for your feet, and then stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from falling evil. Again, just just self-observation here. What is keeping you from growing spiritually? What is keeping you uh, from, from maturing? What are some things that you know I've got to remove from my life? What are some bad influences in my life that I've got to get rid of? Again, what are you reading? What are you watching? What are you listening to? Church, listen to me real quick. Any Thing or anybody that takes your focus off of Jesus is a distraction. You with me? He is first. And you've got to figure out, there are some things I may need to clear. And sometimes clearing up those distractions is a difficult thing to do. Sometimes there are phone calls you've got to make. Dude, I, just, I can't do this anymore. I can't hang out with you anymore. I'm going to love you, and I'm going to pray for you. Whatever. Or I just, I I can't look at this. I can't go there anymore. All right? What do we need to do to clear those distractions away? And then the you is this. We have to really make sure we understand where wisdom comes from. And I love Proverbs. As a matter of fact, I would challenge you, church, commit Proverbs 9, 10 to memory if you haven't already. All right? Because fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom right? Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom, all right? And knowledge of the Holy One, that's what results in good judgment. Get that. So I think flat out, a healthy fear and reverence for the Lord, that is your basic building block, church, for for spiritual growth, for wisdom, for understanding. It's a fear of the Lord. If you don't fear the Lord, you will never grow in wisdom. You've got to begin there. All right, And you desperately need to understand that wisdom comes from God. Wisdom does not come from our government. (laughs) Amen to that, right? Wisdom does not come to our sitting president or president-elect or the one that's going to be there in four more or eight more years. That's not where wisdom comes from. Wisdom does not come from Justin Bieber. (laughs) Um, Now my daughter's paying attention. Wisdom does not come from Beyonce, wisdom doesn't come, I don't know who's the next, uh, the next coolest, you know, Kanye West who thinks he's Jesus or something. That's not where wisdom comes from. Wisdom doesn't even come from Nick Saban, the greatest football coach of the greatest football team ever to win and defeat Mississippi State horribly bad yesterday. Wisdom does not come from all those things, all right? 
Wisdom, some of it comes from our parents, yes, but not even there. Guys, wisdom comes, I've lost you, didn't I? Throw in a football illustration, it's over. (laughs) Wisdom, the foundation, guys, the building block for your growth and your maturity and to make wise decisions, guys, is to have a healthy reverence and fear for God Almighty. Are you with me on that? Understand, that's where true wisdom comes from. I had a friend, and I've mentioned him before, I won't go into that story, but in high school, we were best friends. But shortly after high school, I gave my life to Christ. He didn't. And I may call him up and ask him some, some wisdom. He and I both, he was a singer in my band in high school. I played drums, and he was a singer. And we may talk about rock and roll or music, but there's other areas I just did not seek his advice on because he was far from God. Wisdom, the wisdom, fear of the Lord, was not his foundation. Finally, guys, here's the last one. Here's the S. And I want you to stay grounded in God's word. You know, I realize there's hardly a sermon that goes by that I preach where I don't tell you this. and, And you know what? And I don't apologize for that. I will tell you every single week. All right? I cannot stress enough to you how important it is for you and I daily, not once a week, daily to be grounded in God's word. Matter of fact, look at what Psalm 9412 says. Joyful are those you discipline, Lord, those you teach with your instructions. Again, right here, this thing is full of instructions. And those who, em- who embrace it and live it out, they are joyful. Even if it hurts, there's joy there because we know God loves us, all right? And those you teach with your instructions. And then, and then let's go back to Proverbs real quick. Chapter 4, verses 10 and 13. My child, listen to me and do what I say, and then you're going to have a long, good life. Again, if you clear out all those distractions, don't go on this side of the road, go over here. Now, it may not be good the way the world says it's good, but it's going to be good the way I say it's good, right? And you're going to, you're going to have a long, good life. I will teach you wisdom's way and lead you in straight paths. How many of you want that? I'm going to teach you wisdom's way. I'm going to lead you in straight paths. When you walk, you won't be held back. When you run, you will not stumble, Take hold of my instructions. Don't let them go. Guard them. I love this, guys. Guard them, because look what he says. For they are the key to life. Turn to your neighbor and say they're the key to life. life. I'm going to say it one more time, guys. There is no substitute for God's word. If you deviate from this, if you do not spend time in this, then how in the world are you ever going to make wise decisions in your life? you will not. And you will not embrace the correction and discipline that comes from God because you're not going to recognize it. All right? To refuse and accept discipline and correction in your life, well, it's just plain stupid. Turn to your neighbor and say you're stupid. I mean, and then add, I'm sorry, and then add if, if you lack discipline and correction. Yeah, add that. All right. Some of you have been waiting for years to turn to your neighbor and say that. All right, let me, let me end with a great, let me, all right, settle down. All right, some of you need to repent now. Let me, let me end with this story from M. Scott Peck in his book, The Road Less Traveled. Listen to this illustration. I think this sums it all up. He says, I spent much of my night summer on a bicycle. About a mile from our house, the road went down a steep hill and it turned sharply at the bottom. Coasting down the hill one morning, I felt my gathering speed to be ecstatic. Anybody ever, you know, you've just been on a bike before, man, and you're picking up speed and how awesome that feels? To give up this ecstasy by applying the brakes seemed an absurd (laughs) self-punishment. So I resolved to simultaneously retain my speed and negotiate the corner. However, my ecstasy ended seconds later when I was propelled a dozen feet off the road into the woods. I was badly scratched and bleeding, and the front wheel of my new bike was twisted beyond use from its impact against the tree. I had been unwilling to suffer the pain of giving up my ecstatic speed in the interest of maintaining my balance around the corner. I learned, and there's the key word, he learned. I learned, however, that the loss of balance is ultimately more painful than giving up what is required to maintain balance. It is a lesson that I have continually had to relearn. 
as must everyone. For as we negotiate the curves in the corners of our lives, we must continually give up parts of ourselves. And I thought, you know what? That's an incredible lesson right there. There are some things that we're gathering speed. Things are going well for us in our life. And boom, God says, you know what? This may feel good, but this may not be the best thing for your life. And I'm asking you right now to abandon it. I want to correct this. I want to discipline you because this is not where you need to go. Oh, but God, it feels so good. God, it has to be right. How could something that seems so real and so right and, and feel so good be wrong? But God's wisdom is greater than our wisdom. And church, sometimes there's times we just got to apply the brakes and we've got to stop. And sometimes we don't and we hit the tree, but hopefully we get back up and we look at that mangled wreck and we say, you know what, Dad? I've learned a very valuable lesson today. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we cry out to you and we say, I need you. I want, my desire as your pastor is that we have a church full of wise guys and gals that we make wise decisions as we deal with our community of unwise people, as we deal with people who are making poor decisions in their lives, ungodly decisions every day. And we're not here to wave this in their face and say, I'm better than you. We're just here to say, no, dude, I've been where you are, and it was due to this right here, the instructions within this book in Jesus Christ that turned me around. And I just want to share that love and that correction with you. Amen? Amen. All right, I want to ask you if you would just bow your heads and close your eyes. And here's what I want to ask in our time, our, our, our final seconds together this morning. What is it that maybe you just say, yeah, I'm gaining some speed in this area, but it's time to hit the brakes. There's some things that I've been viewing. There's some things that I've been listening to, whatever it is, some things that I've just got, I've, I've got to get rid of. And we know that correction and discipline is a difficult thing. Man, it stings. But ultimately, it's to restore us. Jesus Christ, thank you for your death and your resurrection. You obeyed your Father, and you left the splendor of heaven, and you died a criminal's death which you did not deserve upon that cross. Even in the garden, in your humanity, you're pleading take this away. I don't think it was because of the pain, because every sin known to man was about to be placed upon your shoulders, yet you endured it. You stayed on the path. And because of that, Jesus, three days later, death was defeated, our sin was defeated, and we are free. Yet some of us are still making dumb decisions. Jesus, help us to live for you. Help us to stay grounded in your word, and to make wise choices. God, we give these to you today. We want to be wiser. Help us to be that. Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. If you, um, listen, if, if the Holy Spirit's dealing with you on something and you need to, um, you know, talk with me about something between the break here, between services, pray with you, I, I want to do that, and I'll be glad to do that.